Well, welcome back, everyone. We're going to jump right into our next panel. Uh, it's entitled Emerging Markets, Increasing Market Access and Education. Uh, again, we encourage you to submit the questions, any questions which we'll try to answer at the end of the session. Um, <clears throat> so please join me in welcoming Marlene Creedy. Marlene is the, the commissioner uh, from the New Jersey Department of Banking and Insurance. And her discussion is with our panelist, Gustavo Caudas, the technical analyst, superintendent of the private insurance, SUSEP from Brazil, uh, Connor Donaldson, CEO, Global Asia Insurance Partnership, and Hannah Grant, head of the Secretariat at the Access to Insurance Initiative. So without further ado, please welcome our, our moderator and panelists. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Anderson. And of course, I want to welcome all of our uh, guests here in the audience to our panel, Emerging Markets, uh, Increasing Market Access and Education of the 2022 NAIC International Insurance Forum. A strong uh, insurance sector is a key indicator of a strong economy. And our goal today on this panel is to highlight how emerging economies are seeking to build and refine what insurance means to their market and to their consumers. One of the key developments over the last 10 years has been the availability and the adoption of new technology, which has the potential to lower costs and increase access uh, to every segment of society in just a few buttons. And we will discuss this in a few minutes. Emerging markets, however, are not immune to other recent trends, and we will also examine how they are addressing other key issues, such as the development and adoption of ESG initiatives, climate, and talent development and retention in the insurance sector. As we indicated, we will have some time at the end of the question, for questions from the audience, so make sure that you have your Slido open on your phones. Uh, the event code is right up should be behind me, but it's definitely on your table. Um, and I know that all of our panelists, their bios are in the program and online. Uh, we want to take as much time as possible for questions and for our conversation. So please refer to the uh, pamphlets for their information. Uh, with that, I want to welcome Gustavo. I want to welcome Hannah and, of course, Connor, my old friend. Uh, welcome to Washington, D.C. Thank you. So let's just jump right into it. And Gustavo, if you don't mind, I'm going to start with you. OK. Brazil, beautiful country, um, has one of the largest insurance markets in the world. Do you think it can grow larger than what it is right now? And if it does, what are some of the challenges that the industry is facing in your country as it moves forward, especially as we emerge from COVID? Thank you, Marlene, for the question. Hi, everybody. Good to be here. Uh, Brazil has a, a, a penetration rate of around 3%, which is quite low. It's below the, the rate of some Latin American countries, in fact. So we do have a lot of room to grow. And the main challenge that we face is about lack of the insurance culture, risk and insurance culture, actually. So uh, because in Brazil, we don't have as many catastrophe risks that many other countries face. So we don't develop that much of a, a, a risk consciousness, let's say that. So the challenge that we face is that we have to, to grow this insurance culture in our people. So this is quite a challenge. Uh, and we had COVID. COVID, despite all its drawbacks, presents a, a great opportunity for us because of the, the the troubles it caused, so it raised awareness about risk. It helped us in that way. And for example, uh, we paid, the, 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 our insurance market paid 70,000 uh, claims in, in life business, which is nearly 10% of the, the whole deaths that we have, 700,000. And also, because of the federal aid that was implemented by the federal government, we have 20 million new users in the banking system because they had to register to receive the, the, the was it, that was via mobile phones and apps and stuff. So this is the other uh, uh, factor that was good because 
people already have a great access and a great use of mobile phones and mobile tech. So they increased their consciousness about the, 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 the benefits of using such technology for financial purposes. So we have these three factors that can come together to present a, a, a great opportunity. And we also have, in the insurance market uh, in Brazil, an extensive distribution network because we have uh, combining natural persons and, and companies over 100,000 brokers. They are all over the country, which is a big country, you know. And also we have a uh, microinsurance regulator. Hannah knows a lot about that. So we don't have a lot in place to, to make it happen. So this is the real challenge, how to make it happen. So uh, Zeb is making its way in, in trying to deregulate something, in flexibilizing and, and foster innovation. So. That's so the way we're going. it's interesting what you just said with regards to COVID that it helped make individuals understand the need for insurance. I always say that in my state of New Jersey, I think that COVID made people realize how important having insurance is. It's some comfort. Um, and, I, and I think that, like you said, having that technology because of the mobile phone might just be a way to start easing into it. Let me just jump over to, to Hannah. Um, you have a broader view of the insurance uh, in the emerging markets. Um, do you see a growing challenge is there? No, thank you for the question, but firstly, just to say it's really nice to be here and physically at an event. I was quite looking forward to be able to see um, the audience rather than the blank screen. <laughs> but with the very bright lights, I'm afraid to say I can't read my notes on the screen, and I also now <laughs> can't see the audience. But anyway, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. But now responding to your question, I mean, the pandemic hit emerging markets, developing economies very hard. I think if you look at some Swiss Re data, you actually see a 2.6% decline in premium, I think, for the year 2020. And then if you look at actually data that came out through the microinsurance network, and they do a, a landscape study, that focuses on the 30, um, I guess, some of 30 of the poorest countries and actually the poorest um, segment of the population. And there you see over 2020 in the pandemic period and actually a 30% reduction in the premiums collected and also the number of lives insured. And I think, I mean, taking from that, I mean, there weren't the systems in place when the pandemic came. So people were unable to transact business remotely, so get access to insurance. Um, companies were actually not able to set themselves up sort of straight away, nor actually supervisors in a lot of cases to be able to operate um, remotely, and people were struggling to sort of renew their insurance policies. So it's been, I mean, a tough period, let's say, in a lot of emerging markets, developing economies. But then um, looking at uh, the Swiss Redata sort of forecasts um, going forward, it's a much more positive story. I think if you have China on its own, um, you see a 9% growth actually projected for 2021. And then you take out China and you actually see a growth of uh, nearly 5% for emerging markets, developing economies. And then contrasting that with the more advanced countries, where you see a growth of only 3%, you can really see that it is the sort of the area of growth, I think, for the future and sort of going forward. And then maybe jumping on to actually what Gustavo was saying. Um, we have seen sort of coming out of the pandemic this increased awareness and particularly when it comes to life and, um, and health and policies there has actually been quite a big growth. I think India currently has double digit um, growth coming out and another sort of factor for I think growth and development of the sector has also been um, the development of value add services on the insurance products and quite a few of these I mean came out of the pandemic. So where you have um, sort of medi advice um, provided um, remotely. And um, I think we saw Britam doing this in Kenya, um, where policyholders could get advice, um, medical advice during the pandemic sort of through their mobile as a value add. We've seen that actually being very effective and very popular. And that's also helped to sort of help the growth, let's say, of, of, the, of the sector. So we are seeing, there are, we're seeing growth coming out after the pandemic. We are, so looking at even actually the figures for 2021, I mean, these are projections that Swiss Re are showing, but even then, I mean, there was still a pandemic going on last year. We weren't physically sort of able to do things, sort of business, go, even go to the office as we can normally. And even then we're seeing companies having adapted, processes having changed, 
and this heightened risk awareness. So even for last year, we're already seeing a, a growth um, yeah, in the premium projections. That's good. So we're pivoting. We're dealing with, with the situation at hand and we're pivoting. Yeah, and Excellent. learning from it and hopefully doing better than maybe even could be in the case before. Excellent. Connor, my old friend, mm -hmm. familiar face to the uh, International Insurance Forum here uh, from your previous role on the IAIS. Um, and now you're with Global Asian Insurance Partnership. Is it fair to call it GAPE? I prefer G-A-I-P. That's fine with me. <laughs> so G-A-I-P, um, it's a new venture, yes. relatively new venture, and you have the support of many countries. Um, many companies, academic institutions, as well as the A2II. Um, can you give us an idea of what are some of your key projects that the organization is undertaking? Oh, perfect. And um, maybe just take an opportunity to say, uh, much like Hannah did, how nice it is actually to be at an event, to actually see people, and oh, to wow. actually be able to shake people's hands and actually enjoy people's company. Um, I spent a lot of time talking to my dog. Uh, over the last couple of years, mm. and a lot of time um, learning the intricacies of, of Zoom and WebEx and a variety of different platforms that I know is going to come in handy going forward. I do, but I'm so happy that I actually I was able to put my laptop away and actually speak to a group of people and hopefully um, uh, be able to enjoy some interactions over the next day and a half and uh, get to catch up with some old friends, so it's so nice to be here. Maybe I'll start by giving a, I was going to say 10,000 meter, but I realize uh, 30,000 feet is probably a better uh, description, uh, description of what GIP is. So what we are is a, is a unique platform that brings together industry supervisors, policymakers, uh, and academia. And our vision is to shape a more resilient future. And our mission and how we're going to do this is through um, supporting and catalyzing action on emerging and accelerating risks and supporting the future development needs of the industry. Our work's organized around three pillars. Uh, so one, we have a living lab, which is where our analytic, uh, more of our research focus is. Second, we have a policy think tank component, uh, which is really about engaging with policymakers and supervisors, helping them to understand developments in the industry, uh, but hopefully also uh, encouraging a conversation around how we can build a more resilient future and the role that they can play. Then third, uh, we have a talent development component, and really there, uh, it's about drawing in new talent into the industry. Uh, it's about upskilling existing talent, helping them to better understand some of the emerging risks and accelerating uh, risks that we're seeing. And third, helping leaders to navigate an increasingly complex operating environment. We identified thematically uh, two focus areas. And the first focus area, as one can expect, uh, particularly for an initiative that was started in 2020, is the pandemic. And secondly, is on climate risk. And I think both of these topics are still very high on the agenda. Um, on the climate side, what we're hoping to undertake uh, really kicking off uh, in the coming months is one, an analysis of sea level rise across Southeast Asia and South Asia, looking at approximately 50 different urban centers. And there, what we want to identify is the scale of the vulnerability that exists. We want to hopefully encourage a dialogue with the sector around what are the services um, and products that can help uh, to narrow some of those protection gaps. And third, how do we then engage with supervisors about building an enabling framework, but also encouraging policymakers to be part of the conversation, particularly as it comes to mitigation, prevention, and adaptation. Our second project on the climate side is really looking at climate uh, risk pricing. And there's a lot of work that's taking place on climate risk pricing on the asset side. But what we really want to do is get a better handle on some of the approaches, both within the sector, but also at the supervisory level, around how climate risk is priced into insurer liabilities. On the pandemic, I think I just one day look forward to a time when we're not talking about it. But I think it's, it's, it's something that's going to leave a, a very significant and lasting impact on how we do our work. And I think uh, to the point that both Hannah and Gustavo made, um, I think there has been a heightened risk awareness. And I think that that's a, a positive, um, but I have a different view on, on how the pandemic is actually 
uh, and what we, uh, how it's impacting the industry and how we need to be mindful of some of the um, minds that we have to navigate as a result. But I'll have the opportunity, hopefully, to come back to that a little later. But our projects on the pandemic side are really going to focus on transitioning away from managing a pandemic towards living with COVID as an endemic. Um, and I think there, there's going to be a lot of implications around mortality and morbidity. And I think the insurance sector is going to play a, a very important role in terms of managing um, our lives from COVID as endemic and play you know, a significant role in how we as societies, economies, et cetera, um, you know, learn to live with this new normal. And so that's um, going to be um, a fairly significant research project for us. And then the second uh, piece on the pandemic side is, so uh, there was, a, I think, a realization that you know, public-private collaboration, uh, particularly when we look at significant risks like pandemic risk, is, is a necessary um, part of the solution. And there, for me, I think it's important um, that we actually think about some of the different mechanisms um, that have been tried, um, how the public and private sector have collaborated looking at significant risks in the past, and hopefully uh, encourage uh, a dialogue amongst uh, supervisors, the sectors, and policymakers in Asia around what are some of the different approaches that we can take. So that covers off at a high level what our work program is going to look like for 2022 and 23. Um, but it's, uh, it's an exciting time, and, and really, um, I think it's fair to say that uh, a lot of the growth and development that's taking place within the sector is really taking place within Asia. And Hana cited some numbers, and I think um, uh, if you look at how premium growth is, is um, occurring globally, um, you see that Asia is, um, I think, really one of the key drivers of that. So it's an so, exciting time. So let me ask you, based on that, so you have a lot of key projects for the organization. Um, how do you think that that is going to affect the insurance market in um, not only the emerging mm -hmm. markets, but in like, you know, Vietnam and Thailand, but in your more established markets like Japan? So I think it's important to recognize that it, it, the insurance industry is a global industry. And so when we think about um, access to different insurance markets, it's not, only a, it's not only an industry concern, it's actually also a consumer concern, and it's also, frankly, um, a prudential and policy concern. I think it's important that we recognize that you know, the implications of some of the physical risks that's manifesting, particularly in emerging jurisdictions that are more susceptible, unfortunately, to increasingly severe and frequent um, catastrophes, uh, but also are going to be primary drivers of insurance premium growth uh, to, uh, in the years ahead, that uh, the industry, um, I think, looks at the opportunity, and I think they, they recognize that you know, they have the opportunity to provide more access and more service. So it's, it's something that I think mature insurance markets, uh, more advanced insurance markets, the players in those markets recognize that the opportunity for growth and, and um, I think a big component of it is going to come in emerging Asia. And so uh, whilst I think our research work will hopefully contribute to discussions that are taking place within some of these jurisdictions, I also recognize that you know, many of the companies that are operating uh, in emerging Asia are actually companies that are you know, operating in, in advanced economies and headquartered there. And so I do think that uh, the work that we do and the di dialogues that we're facilitating are really going to play uh, an important role you know, across the region. Thank you. So let's, let's shift a little bit, because one of the things that I've heard here is technology and insurance. Um, and so I go back to the days of the typewriter. So this is all new to me, too, and I'm learning as I go along. And I still can't handle my mobile, as you call it. Um, but let's talk about that. What are we seeing? I mean, you've seen a lot with respect to your area, the, uh, you know, where you work and the countries that you work with in, in uh, Brazil and in Asia. Um, technology. Is it leading the charge? Is it creating opportunities for the industry? Is it creating um, opportunities for our consumers? Any thoughts? And I'll just throw it out to all of you. Oh, okay. Well, uh, um, technology is, is linked to innovation, right? And, and one thing about innovation is that you can't catch up with innovation because of its very concept that it's new. Nobody knew it before, so we just chase it. We run after it, right? Especially supervisors. We are a reactive community by definition in most ways, 
right? So staying caught up with technology and with innovation for us means to monitor as close as possible the developments that are new, right? And one way of doing it is by the, the, the sandboxes that everybody hears about, right? And it's a way of, of bringing the innovation close to you so you can accompany the process of innovation and monitor it and check whether it is dangerous, it's detrimental to consumers or something like that. Right? And, and we do have a sandbox uh, that is in its initial status yet. We just had two, two editions of it, but we can already it, see some, some, some develops that are good. We have some cases where claims are paid in a question of minutes, right? And we have uh, niches that weren't covered that now can have products for them, like truck drivers. And uh, about the way of the companies will likely transition to, to the regular market. We already have two or three companies that have been, have gone through the process of becoming regular companies, which is uh, uh, the goal, the ultimate goal of the sandboxes, so it's good also. Gutaro, let me, let me just interrupt you for a minute, no. and, and before we hear from Hannah and Connor, let me ask you, because as a regulator, and as you said, it's innovation, technology, how do we as regulators ensure that we're not stifling innovation, we're not slowing them down, because what's good today will be old tomorrow, so how as regulators do we ensure that we're allowing for a safe product out there and we're not stifling it and we're getting it out to the market. Yeah, well, first of all, we must not be afraid of innovation because innovation is good, right? That one of the, the, the reasons why we should monitor innovation is for it to develop, to grow, and, but as a child, <laughs> we have to be protective about <laughs> the environment, right? And one way that we can use also technology in our favor is because the market is evolving, the supervision can, must evolve also. So, so that's why SubTech exists, right? So we're, we're, it's the other side of the coin, let's say, of innovation. And, and it's important that, that supervisors also advance in, in the use of technology to develop their own supervisory capabilities to fulfill their, their, their duties in, in protecting the consumer and the market, to a stable market and protecting consumers and, and so on. So uh, in Brazil, we are trying to use it uh, and we have some initiatives that we are trying to, we are trying to, we are actually in the process of developing what we, I call most, uh, a data-based supervision, which is a risk-based supervision based on data, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? So we have to have tools that can collect data. So we develop a, a, what we call a SRO, a policy registry system. All policies in the future, we're in the process, this is a, will take a few years, will have to be registered with registrators, mm -hmm. which are from the market and from, from uh, clearance chambers and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. They use their Technology there already exists to fulfill this this new role to play this new role in the in the market. So they will have the data, and we are developing tools in, in artificial intelligence and all this stuff to identify gaps, identify problems with money laundering, or trying to understand the way they are using the market is using technology also and and in the effects that it will because innovation is also a, a big black box, right? Mm -hmm. We don't know exactly what companies are, are, are doing with artificial intelligence. So we need to develop our own capabilities in, in, in IT and, and bring our IT teams closer to our inspections teams, a specialist that will help them understand what the black boxes of the companies are doing and if they are, they are detrimental to consumers. So all that is, is a whole package, let's say, that, that we have to implements to be able to fulfill the, the duties that I said. I like what you said about not being scared. That's what we need. Yeah. Oh. Hannah, Connor, any comments? Um, yeah, I mean, going back to your original question about is in some ways insure tech, is technology making a difference? 
I mean, unquestionably, yes, but yes, it has potential, I think, to do a lot more. I think if you look at, I mean, the, the challenges to insurance sector in emerging markets and developing economies, I think the key challenges are things like consumer awareness, good enough understanding of the consumer so you can develop suitable products for them, so the need for, for more data, good efficient claims processes. I think in all of these cases, I mean, good um, technology can come in and provide solutions and make the processes more efficient. It can also help the outreach to consumers, which particularly in a developing country context are uh, often not very easy to reach. So I think there is a lot of potential and we are seeing um, a lot of new insure techs starting up, also more commercial providers, I think, um, coming and in, getting involved in developing countries because it's now more efficient and you can reach economies of scale. So it's, it's more attractive, let's say, to enter the developing markets and I think that's been helped by technology. But where you see the application at the moment, I think it's mainly still I mean, around improving business processes. Um, and we're seeing less application, but there is some sort of on big data, artificial intelligence. So I think there's potential still for a lot more, I guess, sophisticated use of um, technology to help improve or well, improve processes further and improve on the product development. Um, and yeah, the, for the future, I think you're looking at smartphone ownership and looking what the picture is sort of globally. And um, it's, I mean, very positive. So already, I think, looking at Asia, Latin America, we see smartphone penetration of around 75%, and that's projected to grow to sort of about 80, 82%. And even in Sub-Saharan Africa, at least 65% of people already now have smartphones, and that, again, is projected to go up to, I think, 75% over the next couple of years. So and then having I mean, smartphones, having access to good internet is obviously fundamental, and we are, as I say, seeing improvements there. I would, though, sound a word of caution that um, it's important still to have the human touch. Like, technology definitely can't replace it. And I'd say, particularly in developing countries where there isn't sort of an established insurance culture, I think it's very important to have sort of the human touch to, to help people trust the products and make sure they have a positive claims experience. And I'd also just sound a word of caution around gender and sort of women's access to insurance. I think some of the things that have come out of the pandemic a little bit is where things have had to be done on technology platforms that women don't necessarily, and particularly in developing countries, they don't have such good access to mobiles, they don't have necessarily have so much access to the internet. So I think we need to consider all of these things as these business models move um, a bit more digitally. Carmen, let me ask you, these new products, mm. uh, is it a trend, is it effective? I mean, there are issues, as Anna has said, I mean, is this something that we're going to see? Um, is it taking away from the traditional, or is this opening the door for the traditionalists? Sorry, loaded, no, it, it, loaded question. Yeah, it's sorry. a loaded question. Um, yeah, it, it's always nice to come after two very eloquent and, and <laughs> thoughtful speakers because I, I think a lot of what they've touched on is you know, these are the, the critical concerns that, um, and the challenges and opportunities that we're looking at with technology. You know, I, I suppose in some respects when I, when I think about the conversation around technology and insurance, I think it needs to be segmented into a, a few different conversations. So one is uh, technical developments that are facilitated by technology. And there, I think, you know, the development of products that um, you know, rest on um, our ability to, to process and analyze significant amounts of data uh, quickly and efficiently is, is something that I think we see on some of the parametric type products that have been developed. And I think that this is it's not necessarily a pure technology piece, it's actually a technical development uh, within the insurance sector and the type of products that can come that's facilitated by a wider uptake and use of, of technology. I think the second part of the conversation for me is really about how technology is changing, one, the nature of work and the nature of employment, um, but also how it's changing people's interactions with the real economy. And, and there, I think that there's important considerations for the industry to think about when it comes to product design and product pricing. You know, the, the traditional model um, that people used to follow um, to access insurance, purchase insurance, you know, increasingly generations are just not comfortable with that model. And it's, it's fine to say that a human touch is important, 
But frankly, I think a lot of people, when they look for insurance products, they want to be able to do a quick comparison. They want to be able to make a decision based on what their needs are, and they want to be able to purchase it quickly. And you know, these are not generally higher value, uh, longer term products, but these are you know, the risks that you know, young people particularly, or people who are, you know, for example, they look at their vehicle not as a, a, a tool for getting from point A to point B, but rather as a key part of their employment and they work in an informal way or they work in part of a gig economy and what they're looking for in insurance products is different um, than a traditional motor product and, and that's fine, um, that traditional product needs to be there, but we also need to be thoughtful as a sector in terms of responding to the shifting nature of employment and what consumers ultimately are looking for and how technology is changing um, behaviors but also uh, the nature of the risks that people are exposed to. The last part that I would say, and this is you know, maybe uh, be a bit provocative than this, I do think that supervisors and regulators have a very important role, um, but I'm a little bit skeptical about some of the developments that are taking place in, in bringing innovation labs, uh, sandboxes, to, um, and the reason for that is that the insurance, insurance is a heavily regulated industry. And the developments that we've seen um, um, in the sector is based on a sector that's growing up and uh, hand in hand with an increasingly complex regulatory environment. And so it's very difficult, even in an environment, a sandbox or an innovation lab environment, to provide, in the, maybe the language that I think we're all using nowadays, um, equity rather than equality. And it's very difficult for new entrants to the market to navigate um, a, a very complex regulatory environment. It's very difficult uh, for new entrants to try to contort themselves into these um, predefined boxes. And I think that we need, um, as a community of supervisors, regulators, policymakers, to be very mindful of the high barrier for entry. And maybe there's ways that we can not be scared and ensure that um, you know, we can um, actually get beyond being technology neutral to actually being more technology facilitative in terms of how we approach these things as supervisors, regulators, and policy makers. Thank you. And, you know, what you and Hannah have said is something that I find so, um, so correct in that, like, I feel that the older generation, like myself, I like being able to talk to someone, but I can say that my niece and nephew who are in their mid-20s want to do everything on their smartphone and they don't want to talk to anybody. They want to compare it and buy it. So I think we have to look at it as regulators having, and as the industry, having products for all ages, I guess. But they probably still want the chatbots or they want something that can provide them with advice, but maybe it's not the same, yeah, face to face as we probably prefer. Right. Yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. I'm going to jump to another topic and that is ESG. And as we know, E is environmental social and governance and um, in financials and in the finance and the insurance and it's on top of everything that we do. Um, e, the environment, has been very visible, especially globally. Um, however, with our recent events, um, yes, social is getting a lot of highlight prominence. Um, do you see these ESG themes, including inclusivity, gaining an importance in these emerging markets as well? If so, why? And if not, why? If you could explain. I'm just going to throw it out there. Whoever wants to go first. I can. <laughs> All right. Well, definitely we have a pressure, a big pressure of society as a whole about uh, considering all, all the, the ESG aspects in everything we make and it could not be different in the insurance sector, right? Uh, it's a well-based pressure because it's here, right? And we have to face it, we have to tackle it, we have to find ways to survive <laughs> ultimately, right? Uh, we insurance market need this inclusive because, because it's our role we deal with risks. If we do not find a way to deal with climate risk and with environmental risks and stuff like that and how they affect the social side of it, who will, right? Because we are the risk specialists. And the, the, the word that for me it 
represents it's always sustainability, right? It's so spread out there. But sustainability is about it. It's about uh, uh, how to get continuity. And insurance ultimately represents that. Continuity of life, of businesses, of whatever it covers, right? So uh, the thing is that insurance serves society. So the E and the S are indissociable to me, right? And we need a G to make it happen, to make it work. So E, S, G are together, not for chance, but for a reason, right? And, and Brazil, ZEP has a, a, have a, a long history in, in sustainability. We are founding members of the Sustainable Insurance Forum. Mm -hmm. We have a few bumps on the way, but we are always supporting such initiatives. And back in 2016, we had a, HIV was there. What was called by Butch Bacani the, the Carnival of Sustainability in Brazil because we have a, a Sustainable Insurance Forum meeting. Uh, market meeting and, and uh, a 2AI training that we're in. And in the market event, we signed along with the National Confederation of Insurance Companies and the UNEPFI a commitment to apply efforts to, to, to promote the TCFD principles in our market. It's a hard thing to do because nobody knows exactly how to do it. I'll ask corner about that because he said he's working on, on measuring <laughs> climate risk and, and this is something that the will is there but we have to know how to transition to action to, to turn will into action right and we also have a, an opportunity in Brazil because Brazil is applying to be a member of the OECD right mm -hmm. and we are in the process of, of starting the process of of becoming a member, and we are reviewing all our regulation and laws and everything to comply with OECD's recommendation, decision, and stuff. So it's also an opportunity since we are making it happen. We are analyzing and changing whatever needs to be changed to, to also implement, to, to embed EST in all of this. Excellent. Anna, Anna? Yeah, I mean, A2II works with insurance supervisors um, globally, so I'll give my answer um, with respect to what we're seeing supervisors doing, um, particularly in developing countries. Um, so, you yeah, know, environmental, I think, has come up a lot on the agenda in the last few years, um, and we're seeing quite a lot of work being done by supervisors to really look at climate risk and what their role is, both with respect to um, closing the protection gap but also with respect to how they can manage climate risk in the way that they do their business. And I'd say maybe Chile, Morocco, and South Africa, I think are actually really good examples of countries who have moved a bit further forward, maybe than some other developing countries. And I think in Morocco, um, they're developing a framework to ensure insurers integrate climate risks um, considerations into their risk management process. Um, and in Chile, they're actually, as of beginning of next year, um, supervisors will be required to actually report um, in their annual reports on ESG criteria. So there's definitely sort of some underway. I think it's still a relatively early stage when I compare it with what more developed countries are doing, but there's a lot more interest on it. And A2I provides capacity building support to insurance supervisors. And when we ask now what topics are top of your agenda, I'd say climate risk is probably the top one that's, that's coming up at the moment. Um, looking more at the S, um, here, and it's something that's already come up on the very first session this morning, diversity, equity, and inclusion is definitely also growing in interest, or there's growing interest um, in developing countries. Um, particularly, I'd say, on gender. I think that's the main topic that we're seeing supervisors really wanting to, to focus on a bit more. And A2I has actually been doing quite a bit of work with insurance supervisors to really help them think through what their role can be both in promoting um, gender diversity and things within the sector, but also increasing sort of women's access to insurance. But one of the big challenges we face, and I think this is probably also true actually for developed countries, is the lack of gender disaggregated data that's available. So it's very hard to really understand what the, the issues are, or even actually if there are issues, if women do have problems in getting access, because the data is just not there. 
So actually, A2I is now working on a gender segregated toolkit for insurance supervisors, which should help um, them to collect the data, but also should help with the analysis of the data um, once it's collected. Excellent. And Khan? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe just on the point that Gustavo raised, and I think it's, it's really important. The E and the S are very difficult um, to isolate. And, and I say this because I, I'm a firm believer that actually climate-related risk, environmental risk, lays bare um, some of the, I think, most um, unfortunate aspects from a social perspective. Um, about how certain populations, certain segments of the population disproportionately um, bear um, uh, the vulnerability and the risk. And I do think that um, looking at it from the perspective of how do we ensure a strong focus on the S, I think it's through actually maintaining a strong focus on the E and the G as well. Um, I'm originally from uh, Vancouver. Uh, Canada, and I'm not sure how many people are aware, but actually Vancouver faced um, you know, a remarkable 2021, and Vancouver more broadly, uh, the province of British Columbia. Uh, over the course of that year, there was a fire, uh, burnt down an entire town in less than an hour. Uh, interface fire, uh, very tragic. Um, very small town, about 1,500 people, but nevertheless, uh, to see a fire burn an entire city down in such a short period of time is very scary. Then we had um, some of the worst flooding uh, that British Columbia has ever seen um, actually wiped out all of the roads uh, that connect Vancouver to the rest of Canada. And as you can imagine, um, particularly in an environment where I think all of us are aware of some of the supply chain challenges uh, affecting West Coast uh, ports right now, um, it, it put uh, the city in a, in a very difficult place. And I went back at Christmas time, and the first time in my life there was gas rationing. Uh, store shelves are empty, um, so it's it's not only it's not only uh, uh, an emerging market issue. I think it's one that you know, developed economies are increasingly vulnerable as well, and the environment that we're operating in, um, you know, it's it, it's quite scary how the risk profile uh, is changing and changing so rapidly. And I do think that um, you know even in a place an advanced economy like Canada a well-developed insurance market, what we saw was actually um, a very low number when it came to insured losses and a very high number when it came to uninsured losses. And I can tell you that the people who disproportionately bared uh, the brunt um, were generally uh, lower income uh, minority populations. And for me, it just draws so clearly um, why when we think about um, the environmental side. We need to be so aware of the disparities of impact on the social side. And I think keeping this dual track focus is so critical uh, in terms of how we actually realize the, the value and the role that insurance can play in economic but also social resilience across communities. So um, it's a bit of a, you know, a side story um, but nevertheless, it, it so deeply affected me that you know, to see it happen in a place that you never thought it would happen you know, really lays bare um, you know, the, the importance of you know, the industry, uh, the regulatory and supervisory community um, to really work uh, closely together in terms of making sure that you know, we can support insurance and the sector in realizing the promise that it has. Let me ask you, because I think that we've all, as regulators and in members of the industry, we've all seen and have uh, heartbreak stories, especially in the last several years, whether it's flooding, drought, fires, uh, the rationing of gasoline, live through it, uh, red flag, green flag. Um, how, do we, how do you think we should be able, should it be the industry, should it be us as regulators, how do we educate our consumers so that they can mitigate these risks? Because you said it really impacts our lower income families. <laughs> you know, it's a complex situation, and I think it's one that we need to be, as um, a group of stakeholders who are passionate about insurance, very mindful of the fact that we have a job to do uh, in terms of raising awareness amongst insurance consumers about what the insurance sector can 
um, but also just as importantly cannot do. And that uh, I think is, is critically um, you know, important and all of us uh, have a role to play in that. It's, it's, it's something that I think traditionally the insurance sector, you know, how to diplomatically put this, it hasn't been a strength. It, it hasn't been the thing that's on the top three accomplishments of the insurance sector. I think that the sector, uh, and that includes um, you know, the supervisory and regulatory community, really owe it to consumers to help them better understand uh, the nature of insurance, what it can and cannot do. Um, because I think, and you know, the point that I wanted to make about the pandemic earlier, um, I regret bringing it up again, but nevertheless, I think it's an important one, is that in the eyes of many um, potential policyholders, the pandemic, whilst raising risk awareness, I think also um, there was a detrimental impact on the insurance sector. And that detrimental impact was in the form of people saying, well, the government was there for me. And I say, well, actually, what the government did was provide insurance. And it was the worst kind of insurance. It was insurance that was given and paid for with premiums that are in the form of future obligations of taxpayers. And I think that we have to be very mindful that there is a large segment of the population in emerging markets and developed markets where there may not be a full appreciation of what the private sector can provide, uh, what the private sector and the public sector in collaboration can provide. Um, and unfortunately, um, whilst greater risk awareness, yes, um, also, I think um, there's an important job for all of us to do in terms of helping to shift that conversation away from people thinking that the fiscal capacity of governments is always going to be there when they face a, a significant risk, because I don't think that that's the case. Thank you, and I understand what you're saying with regards to um, not understanding and the government also being involved and how it can have whether it's a positive impact temporarily or a negative impact in the long run. Hannah, um, Gustavo, any comments, especially in Brazil? Um, how, how do you educate your consumers so they can mitigate these risks? Well, uh, I think uh, the, the, the key words are risk management here, right? Because uh, I, am a, I have a, an ABA in risk management and try to teach insurance or to, to show insurance without teaching risk management and all its steps, risk identification, risk assessment, risk controlling and mitigation, and financing risks and monitoring. It's like showing a tool and not showing why you use it, how to use it. So uh, uh, these things can have to, 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 to go together. And, and the essential, here we come again with sustainability, right? So it plays a, a key role in this because the risk management process is about sustainability, it's about continuity, right? And in Brazil, we face again the challenge that we were talking about in the first question, that is lack of the culture, right? And so we try to, to overcome this gap uh, with what we have in place in Brazil, the national strategy for financial education. The government, the federal government has in place this as continuous program. Every year we have initiatives, we have the, the, the week of national financial education, and stuff like that, where the, the central bank, the Securities Commission and SUSEP work together in, in actions to promote financial education, trying to foster this, this culture, but we still have a long way to go. Now I'd agree, I mean, with both the others, I mean, education, awareness, I mean, is really key but also the industry taking advantage, let's say, of when some disaster, I mean, like a pandemic COVID strikes, to really where people are more risk aware to then step in with suitable products sort of afterwards um, at the right moment to take advantage of that awareness. I was also just thinking of whether I agreed or not with what Connor was saying about um, how in some ways the pandemic the government stepped in, insurance was provided, although people hadn't bought it. And I was thinking of the very poorest countries to the government couldn't step in. They didn't protect the SMEs. They didn't provide some unemployment coverage for people losing their jobs. They simply couldn't because the government didn't have the money on their balance sheets. So I think the experience in the really poorest developing countries, I mean, really was pretty bad, I mean, as we've seen through the pandemic. 
But then that is an opportunity now for insurance companies to try and provide where these protection gaps were seen to now try and provide good products to sort of change that in the future. So, you know, we've, we've talked about a couple of different things here, and I think I'm going to bring it back to what the panel before us uh, discussed towards the end, which was developing and retaining talent. And we're talking about educating our consumers and at the same time working hand in hand with the industry. And I guess to some degree, we're educating our industry as well. As regulators, um, what are you seeing with regards to the development and the retention of talent at the corporate level globally or in the regulatory level, my level, um, in your emerging markets areas? I, I, maybe I'll, I'll take the opportunity to go first on this one because this is an area where GIP is uh, very active and you know, it's uh, very exciting for me. And I think it's um, with the insurance sector operating in an increasingly complex environment, um, I think it's critically important that we um, recognize that um, <coughs> efforts that are being made from a diversity, uh, equity, and inclusion perspective um, the need to draw in uh, new talent um, from different perspectives, um, these things you know, fit together um, in an important way because, as I was mentioning earlier, you know, the, the way in which consumers interact with financial services products is changing. Uh, the way in which um, you know, people are employed is changing. The way in which people look at the risks that they face over their entire lifetime is changing. And I think that as a result, you know, we really need to make a concerted effort to make sure um, that we are bringing in uh, new talent. And I say new talent, not only in the traditional fields that I think people find themselves working in insurance, but also you know, I think it's important to recognize that we need to do a, a better job of bringing in uh, fresh ideas and fresh perspectives uh, to the insurance sector. And so one of the things that we're going to be working on at GIP uh, is going to be a, a case study challenge that's going to be open to students across Singapore. And really the, the idea behind it is how do we excite students um, from a variety of different faculties um, to actually think about the problems that insurance um, can address and bring some innovative thinking and perspectives um, to those discussions. So uh, we'll, we haven't fully formed what exactly the question is going to be, but it's going to be something that's relevant from both the general insurance side and the life and health side. It will probably be on something related to the changing nature of employment and addressing some of the protection gaps associated with uh, gig economy workers. But I do think that you know, we have to recognize that in this increasingly complex world, you know, we need to bring in wider uh, uh, set of perspectives into the industry. And I think you know, doing things uh, to get young people excited about insurance is important. I think we also need to leverage off what uh, I would call the values alignment between insurance and, and you know, young people today. I, I do think that there's an increasing demand for people to find employment in places that they feel are in line with their core values. And I think the insurance sector has a natural advantage in that space, and it's not one that we've been able to really maximize in terms of how we communicate why people should work in insurance and devote their careers to it. So it's an exciting time. I think it's really an opportunity for the insurance sector um, you know, in this current climate, in this current uh, you know, operating environment for the sector. But it's, it's something that I think you know, we have to make a concerted effort on because ultimately, you know, wide perspective, diversity of thought, diversity of perspective, um, diversity of training, it, it, these are all things that are going to create you know, better insurance uh, for uh, changing consumer demands. Anna, Gutavo? Yes, speaking from what HY sees from supervisors, I mean, in developing countries, I think, I mean, I'd say they have relatively limited resources, I mean, for a starter, so they, there are a few um, schemes that try and bring graduates into the insurance sector. I know South Africa are doing it. I know Rwanda have a program now where they're trying to, I think they're doing an essay writing competition where the winners of the essay writing competition would then get a scholarship to, to spend some time in the insurance sector. But I'd say the main focus is actually once the talent is within the industry to try and develop and give people good trainings and things to develop themselves. Um, and I know, I think Brazil and Gustavo would know more about this, but I think SUSEP has a scheme where people can go abroad and study for a year. 
And um, I know the Kenyan regulator, for instance, is also recognizing there's very little actuarial expertise in the country. They actually pay for people to go to the UK to gain actuarial qualifications to then ideally come back and use those in the Kenyan market. Mm -hmm. So there are, I mean, some schemes underway, but overall I'd say there's definitely a need for more and there's limited resources to do it, which is also, I mean, the organization I work for, the Access to Insurance Initiative, is a key part of what we do, is building up the capacity of the supervisors um, in the developing countries. We were actually set up as a, a seven-year project, but then it was recognized, and I mean, we're now 13 years on, so then it was recognized that there is actually a very long-term ongoing need for this sort of capacity building um, with the supervisors. Excellent. Well, uh, I think I, I, Carl is right when you talk about the, the, the opportunity that, that we have here, right? Um, the thing is that people are not aware of the risks and, and in fact, the insurance sector is not attractive to young people. We don't see people, I want to work in the insurance sector, right? They, when they talk about talking, I mean, working in the financial sector, they want to go banking or securities. Oh, it's where the money is, and it's so exciting. But when we, uh, coming back to, to what I said about the risk management approach, this can be an opportunity also because when you apply a risk management approach, we, we broaden the, the, the perspective, right? It's a more, uh, inclusive uh, set of activities that can be more attractive. And it's beneficial to, 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 for people to understand in this, what Conrad said, climate change, there's this whole climate change noise that we have, which is very real and now, immediate, and, uh, it's an opportunity for, for that also. Excellent. I'm taking notes because I'm going to bring this back to New Jersey and use it in my department as well. How to entice people to come and work uh, in our department, making it more exciting. Um, so I was given the signal. We're going to take some uh, questions from the audience. And I wish I could say I know how that works, but I guess I read from the screen. OK, and these are, these are all good to go here? OK. So let's see. Um, IAIS shifting focus from financial crisis reforms to other areas that are more relevant across jurisdictions. Will this be positive for emerging market yeah. members? I'm happy to take this one. <laughs> I, I threw it onto the floor. Here we go. Well, IAIS is really changing the focus and they just put together the supervisory form, right? And why I'm happy to take this question because we have years ago complained about the, the, the restructuring, the first restructuring of, of AAS back then when the student committees turned into working groups and task forces, that we were losing these instances where we could talk about, ask about how you do it because we had just opened our reinsurance market and we had the MPS SC back then, <laughs> the, and the reinsurance subcommittee, where we did this, and they, they merged the reinsurance subcommittee with the MPS subcommittee, and but the, the new role was not including this, this kind of discussions. So we, I, I personally, I sent a, an email to Yoshi complaining about it. Yoshi, where can we ask questions? How do you do that? Well, we can exchange experiences. And I think this is very important because we were so worried about the, the macroprudential stuff back then because of the crisis mm -hmm. that this was just put aside. And I think this is putting AAS to work for all the members and the majority of the members are on the lower level, right? Mm -hmm. So it's important that, that they have this shift. So let's take a few more here. Um, and I'll throw it out to, to anyone that can answer. Uh, when companies are considering expansion to emerging markets, what are they looking for in terms of legal framework? What do they see as an impediment? Now, I, I don't know if you guys are attorneys, but if you have any idea of what a company would, what obstacles they would have going into an emerging market, if you could share. So uh, maybe I can offer a, a quick view. Um, I think certainty, um, and there's a variety of different legal forms. 
that an insurance company can enter into an emerging market. But I think most important is actually just giving that legal certainty. Um, and I think at the same time, you know, when we think about what are the impediments uh, for companies operating in emerging markets, I think we need to be you know, frank with ourselves that a lot of the times the challenges relate to uh, political risk, uh, certain economic risks, investment risks that make operating within uh, some emerging markets very difficult and um, potentially um, weigh down that cost-benefit analysis. Um, so I think it's important, one, um, that we recognize that certainty um, is, is critically important, um, but we also need to recognize that when it comes to the um, impediments that a number of the impediments have to do with uh, the risks that are outside of uh, the supervisor's control. And um, I think um, recognize that uh, organic development within those markets is probably going to be you know, one of the key, key drivers of uh, insurance market growth. Mike, can I mean, maybe add to that as well? I think what we hear from insurance companies when entering developing countries that it's often not being able to transact business like completely digitally can be a real challenge. Um, not being able to do e-signatures. I think this is something actually the pandemic has definitely helped change and many more developing countries now accept e-signatures, but that wasn't necessarily the case a few years ago. And I think it's also just speed of getting product to market. This is something that like InsureTechs bring up quite a lot. The product development approval process can often be quite lengthy. And I think that's a challenge, particularly for insure techs who have quite a short sort of life cycle and haven't got the, the funds to keep themselves going while they're waiting for the product to be approved. But I think, again, I mean, this positive side, I think these sandboxes that are appearing are giving an opportunity to get things out a little bit quicker and have a, more, a quicker sort of conversation with the regulator. But I right, saw you yeah. wave. Uh, in addition to what that, that was said, I would say that they look for homogeneous environments, right? We have. We have to have convergence of, of the regulation across jurisdictions, and IAS plays an important role in that with its ICPs, right? The ultimate goal of ICPs is to have conversions of the regulation of different jurisdictions so they don't are too different. Uh, Petra is here somewhere. Europa has a process of equivalence that they analyze the, the regulation of, of third countries outside of the, the EU, right, to check whether their regulation is similar to the to European mm -hmm. regulation. So, and companies are interested in that because their home jurisdiction, their home supervisors, will charge them more capital if they are working, you know, operating in a country that does not have a, a regulation, a supervision that's minimally similar to what they have at home. Mm -hmm. So it's costly. So there's a question here that I find interesting. Um, inflation. It's always in the news here in the United States. Uh, so how do you see inflation affecting developing countries and how will this impact consumers' access to insurance? Maybe I'll take a first stab. It's just to say that I think um, inflation in emerging markets, particularly in, in Southeast Asia at the moment, is quite significant. And what it's doing is eroding people's ability to actually make discretionary spending. Um, and unfortunately, I think insurance often fits within discretionary spending. So it's having a significant impact uh, within a number of emerging markets. And I worry that um, particularly the track that we're on right now, it's probably going to get worse before it gets better. Okay. That's very sobering. <laughs> Hannah, good <Gustav. laughs> I can I mean, agree it's just a big challenge. It was just taking me back to last week. We had a sort of innovation pitch from, we have an innovation lab and we had um, Zimbabwe actually taking part. And the question they asked to sort of us as a panel at the event was, well, what can we do with the hyperinflation? And I mean, Zimbabwe really does have hyperinflation in our country. We're trying to develop this new product, but how can we deal with this in the development of this new sort of index-based product that we're thinking of? And I'm afraid the panel didn't have an answer to that question, but it's just acknowledging that it does, I mean, obviously take the money away from the consumer and it makes it very difficult to be able to project and develop things long term. Yeah. Gustavo? Yeah, I think it. It's a huge problem because I, I, I was a broker before I joined Suzette and I still accompany some forums of discussions between brokers and in the last month or so we saw a lot of talks and complaints about how they were losing renewals because the prices went up so much 
because not only because of, of the, the claims, because of the period in, in the pandemic where claims went down and now they're growing again, and also because the, the price of the, the, the goods that in, are insured are skyrocketing <laughs> in Brazil, because not only because of inflation, but also because of the dollar rate, right? So everything that, that the, the dollar impacts is rising prices also, and everything uh, collaborates to, to higher prices in insurance, so they're just losing renewals because of that. So access to insurance in terms of affordability mm -hmm. is a very, very present issue. Now. Yeah, affordability, that's, that's, I guess, the key. I mean, I think families find themselves, do I use this money to, say, pay the rent, put food on the table, or pay my insurance? So, interesting. Um, let's do one more. Oh, actually, I'm like, they're hesitating. Either stop or one more question. Stop. I have to stop. So I want to thank you all for joining us. I want to thank you all for joining us. I really appreciate the time we've spent here. I hope the uh, members were able to get some good information on what is happening in the emerging markets. And of course, since you're going to be here, they're all, uh, I hope you don't mind if they approach you and ask you more questions, because we do have a series of questions on this board that we weren't able to get to. So again, thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the day. And thank you, everyone, for having us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great.